That really is, we're going to look tonight at John 16, that really is the response of the disciples to what Jesus was teaching in John 15 when he said, we looked last week, 11, uh, 10 times in that passage, abide with me. He was saying that to them. And so what we're looking at tonight is this phase four of disciple making. Part four, the fourth time we've looked at this, remain in me or abide in me. And we're going to dig into that a little more. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we bow before you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Grateful we can gather tonight to close out the Lord's Day together. We are mindful that our Lord Jesus Christ, in some of the final teaching that he gave to the twelve, to the eleven, exhorted them and through them exhorts us to abide in him, to remain in him. And to do that through the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And our response to that, our heart cry response is the same as theirs was as they looked to Jesus physically in the eyes. And we, by the eyes of faith, as we walk through this weary land on our way to eternity, to a place where there we will weep no more, we cry out, abide with me. Don't let me go. Don't let me fall. So teach us tonight from your word how to persevere as we live having confidence that you are preserving us, you are keeping us from falling, you are protecting us and by the Spirit convoying us to the safe haven that is our eternal home. Help us to be students who learn with a view to doing, to be disciples who know that you've called us to be disciple makers, who will leave a legacy when we're gone of disciple makers. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're looking at John 16 tonight, verses 1 to 15, and really we'll look at the other verses and then kind of wrap up uh, looking at verse 33. We want to bear down on verse 15 tonight, primarily. John 16, verses 1 to 15. I hope you have your Bibles. I hope you found that in your Bibles. And if you don't have your Bible, we're going to put it on the screen for you. Let's stand together, if you will, and follow along as I read this portion of God's Word. Remember, this is teaching. It begins in chapter 13 uh, in the upper room where he takes the towel and Judas leaves and then Jesus begins to unload this incredible amount of teaching. In fact, I think, I really think that in chapters 14, 15, 16, and perhaps even 17, there is, there is a book on uh, leadership and disciple making. That's what he's pouring into them. Follow along. I've said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I've said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I'm going to him who sent me. And none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine 
and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. Words designed to comfort them because they were struggling at this point at the prospect of his departure. He assures them, though they can't understand it, that they will be better off when he is gone. Thank you. Please be seated. Someone suggested that there was in a magazine a picture that showed a plain bar of iron. It was worth five dollars. Then they observed that if you took that same bar of iron and made it into horseshoes, it would be worth ten dollars and fifty cents. If you took that same bar of iron and rather than making it into horseshoes, you fashioned it into needles, it would be worth five thousand dollars. If you took that same bar of iron and shaped it, fashioned it, used it to make balance springs for watches, it would actually be worth $250,000. The same bar of iron. What's the difference in it? It's how it's used. How it's used. We take that analogy, and you've heard the one, of course, about the... Uh, about the, the uh, fiddle, the, the violin that was found at auction and was about to be auctioned off for practically nothing and a man stepped forward and began to play it and when he played the beautiful sound of the, the bids went soaring sky high and the difference was, as, as the parable is told, that it was the touch of the master on the violin. Well, it's the same is true of us. You know, we, the devil will lie to us and tell us we are common things, practically worthless. And he'll particularly point out our shortcomings and our failings and our flaws and remind us that we are, we are worth hardly anything to anybody, much less to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we've got to remember that as followers of Jesus Christ, disciples of his, we are, we own, we are owned by him. He gives us value. I would remind you that in Ephesians 2, that, that wonderful passage, verses 8, 9, and 10, By grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Then verse 10, one of my favorite verses. For we are his workmanship. And I've told you through the years, that word workmanship there is in the original language is the word poema. And if you hear that, you hear the word poem. We are his poem. We, the, the, a congregation, a gathering of believers... This gathering tonight constitutes, to the extent that all of us are saved by grace through faith, we constitute an anthology of poems. We have a common story we tell about the glorious grace of God shown to us as sinners in and through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet our story is told differently, though it's the same focus. An anthology of poems. We're valuable. I would imagine that when Jesus taught what he taught in verse in chapter 15, exhorting them to abide in him, that he was going to be leaving, that they began to be very distressed and, and feeling like the whole thing was for naught, that it, they'd been failures. He'd been with them about 34 months, as best we can piece together the, uh, the chronology. He had trained them. And now he's about to release them. He invited them to come and see where he lived, how he lived. He invited them to, to come uh, after him, follow him. He's continued this to come and be with him and now to remain in him. Abide in me. And yet when he says that, he's already told them he's leaving. How are they going to abide in in him or abide with him if he's going to leave. And so they're, they're very distressed at this point. Uh, in fact, if you look at, uh, at the text, he's warned them. The first things he does is he said, I'm telling you these things to keep you from falling away. 
We've looked in Mark's gospel recently where he said, all of you are going to abandon me. We looked this morning at how they actually did. And he said, I'm telling you these things so you won't fall away. And it's, it's not so that, the, he's not saying here so that you won't lose heart, but so that you won't fall away completely, that it, that it won't be something you completely turn your back on. They're going to put you out of the synagogues. The hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he's doing God a service. That happened in the Roman Empire, of course. I told you before that, that these Christians who became the first century martyrs were put to death in various awful ways in the name of being godless. They were atheists. That's what, that was their crime. They didn't embrace all the Roman gods. Now you read that and say, how could that be? I would suggest to you that today, all over the world, 21st century martyrs are being slaughtered in horrendous ways because they are infidels, is what they're being called. They don't follow the one, quote, true God, Allah. And I would suggest to you that coming to our culture will be the opportunity for us to be identified as folks who, who do not bow down to the, to the gods of the culture and put to death. So he's warning them about this. It's going to happen. They will do these things, verse 3, because They've not known the Father nor me. He just, just, just said, just understand, how could people do that? They don't know God. They don't know Jesus. But I've said these things to you that, so that when their hour comes, when it comes time for them to do this, you may remember that I told them to you. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. We've talked about that, about how you learn as a disciple maker that you don't, uh, one fellow says, you don't back up your dump truck and dump your whole load in the lap of a, of a young uh, disciple. That that you, you bring them along the way. You, you, ex you introduce them to things and expose them to things. And I think it was uh, Bradford who was quoted by Whitfield who said, I would, I would much rather introduce a young believer to the elementary school of repentance and faith before I take him into the university of predestination and election. That's good counsel, isn't it? Yeah. First things first. He said, I was with you. So there was no need for him at that time earlier on to talk about them living after he was gone. But now I'm going to him who sent me, verse 5. And none of you ask me, where are you going? And then verse 6, but because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. So they're very, uh, they're very distressed. You can imagine all the, think about this, Passover was to be a high holy time, a great memorial meal to help put in context the, the suffering they were experiencing at the hands of whoever the, the occupiers might be, in this case the Romans at this time. This was a very sad and somber scene. Feeling useless. How are we going to go on without him? So here's where he begins to try to, to bring comfort to them. Verse 7, I tell you the truth. It's for your good that I'm going away. This is one of the paradoxes of the gospel message. How could it be for their good that the one to whom they have tied their lives these last three years, whom they've seen do incredible things, whom they've seen confound the wisest of the wise in their day, how could, how could they be enhanced if he leaves? Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So he's, this is the second time now in these, in these passages we've studied that he has promised them that they will be better off after he departs. One writer said it this way, unless Jesus departed, the Holy Spirit wouldn't come. If the Holy Spirit didn't come, the disciples wouldn't significantly change. The work wouldn't multiply. 
and thus much of their training would have been in vain. It's through this very unlikely band of 11 who will add, have a 12th added to them after Pentecost to fulfill that number of 12 that the world will be turned upside down. That was the criticism of them in the book of Acts. Those who have turned the world upside down have come here too. They would do that through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It is one of the ironies, is it not? That very often Christians' greatest gains come in our greatest losses. I read an article this past week. Brother Norman mentioned it this morning about Iraq, about the about people turning to Christ. There are more people, the leadership, the Ayatollahs in Iran <clears throat> are petrified. There are more people coming to faith in Jesus Christ in Iran now than at any time in modern history. They suffer the loss of everything. They feel abandoned and betrayed by people in the West who have in the past stepped in to advocate for them. Yet the gospel spreads like wildfire. Another, another interesting note is if you study history, what you're going to discover is this. That the gospel has never flourished for very long where it has been the dominant culture. It always flourishes counterculture. It's one of the ironies of the gospel. And that's why we've got to learn, as I've referenced before, we've got to learn, cultivate the mindset of, of Pastor Samuel Lamb of China, who's, who's gone to be with the Lord now, who said, persecution is good for the church. That's just a mindset we don't have, but we've got to cultivate it. One writer said this, disappointments, sickness, financial setbacks, and even divorces can bring new vistas of opportunity. The difficult challenge is to see the good during the loss. It's, he gave this analogy, I thought it was good. It's like trying to drive through thick fog. You're still on the path, you just can't always see it. So Jesus is dealing with their, their sadness here. He's talking about a great change coming. One writer said, history teaches that people love progress but hate change. And they, he's talking about a major change. They had gone through a major upheaval in their lives to, to leave everything and follow after him. These are young men by and large. And now in their prime, three years trained, he's going to depart. That's a major change. And yet he assures them that it means progress for the gospel. You think about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. See, we don't have to face this to the, extent, to the extent that they do because we have not lived physically in the presence of Jesus. But we do have to trust the same thing that he's teaching here. He said in verses 8 through 11, when he comes, he'll convict the world of concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. The major work of the Holy Spirit. Why, why do we need to be light and salt? Why do we need not to be content to hunker down and huddle, but rather go and shine? Because our very presence in the world, think about this, you've seen this before, maybe you haven't identified it. Your presence as a follower of Jesus Christ when you're living for him we talked this morning about the, the danger of not doing that of being of uh, people being surprised when you're a Christian but, but when you're living for him not being obnoxious just simply living for him that compelling winsome witness of a crucified and risen Savior they're convicted by you because see uh, if you're right they're in serious trouble. Why do people rail against our positions? If you think about it, I mean, just think about some of the positions. I won't, I won't chase this rabbit too far, but the idea that, that life is sacred, has it ever dawned on you how hypocritical a person is 
who is breathing this earth's atmosphere and arguing for abortion? Someone thought their life was sacred. The hypocrisy of it. But it's so obvious. Life is intricate. I saw a picture of a preborn baby. You could hold him in the palm of your hand. Twelve weeks in gestation. Perfectly formed, fully formed. You could hold that out and people would say, it's a bluff. Now, how can they be that way? Because you, they have to rail against that because if, if we're right, they are doomed for their position. Take the same thing on the whole discussion of marriage. The LGBTQ agenda. If we are right, then they are wrong in a deadly, damnable way. And you can go on down the line. The exclusivity of Jesus Christ. If we are right, then they and most of the people they know are headed to hell. And probably most of the people they have known have gone to hell. And so, so they rail against us. The Holy Spirit comes and he convinces and convicts the world of sin. In the same way, Concerning sin, because they don't believe in Jesus. Concerning righteousness, he says, because I go to the Father. You'll see me no more. That, that this, what does he mean by that? The Holy Spirit will come and demonstrate through the witness of the, of the apostles, and he did that. Look at Peter at Pentecost. That Jesus died and rose from the grave and has ascended on high. Paul said, seen by 500 brothers, most of whom are alive as I write, as I pen 1 Corinthians and close this letter out. If he died and rose and ascended, then what he said was true. He died for our propitiation. He rose for our justification to demonstrate that, that he is indeed the righteousness of God and is auth authorized by God to grant a right standing to God in the presence of God by grace through faith. And so he's ascending to the Father and that, that reality, that message, that, that living hope, how do you have hope in you? Because Jesus Christ died and rose again. That that is a convicting work of the Spirit to convince of righteousness. That he's the righteousness of God. And then of judgment. Because if he conquered sin and death, then he conquered hell and the grave. And the, the ruler of this world, the prince of this world, the God of this world, has been judged by him. You ever, I wonder this sometimes. Why does an atheist get so upset? Why does he get so worked up? If he doesn't believe in God, then what, is it, what does it matter? What does it matter to, to him or her that I, in their, in their language, waste my time believing in God? Why? Because there is inside of them, because they're creatures made in the image of God, this, this knowledge of the godness of God and our presence condemns them, convicts them, and they rail against me. So he gives this three-pronged work of the Holy Spirit concerning the knowledge of sin and the, the righteousness of Christ and the reality of judgment to come. If he lived and died and rose again and conquered all of the known enemies of this world, then, then he has ascended, sitting on high, and we have a day. The Hebrew writer said, it's appointed unto us once to die and after that to judgment. And I think that deep down inside, the hardest person you know, they know they have a date, an appointment that will be kept, no matter how they avoid it. 
That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Well, how does he do that, folks? He doesn't do that in abstract. He doesn't do it uh, as, as John 3, Jesus describes the, the Spirit moving like, like wind through the trees. He doesn't do it in abstract. He does it only in the context of personhood. Sin is only a meaningful idea discussed in terms of personhood. So, why is it so critical that liberal scholars debunk the notion or attempt to debunk the notion that Genesis 1 through 11 is historical because it addresses sin in the first persons if they can reduce it to simply mythologies a story fairy tailing then then maybe it's not a reality all these things if you start thinking about them they all weave together So just be sure here, the Spirit brings to the world through the witness of the people of God this overwhelming knowledge of sin. I told you before, when we, when we went through the Ten Commandments years ago, that, the, that there's enough of God revealed in nature to, to convict every son of Adam and every daughter of Eve at every place on the planet that there's, there is right and wrong. They may not agree on what right and wrong is. I told you at that time we went through, you may remember, you can travel the globe and you, you, you bump into different mores. There are different societies well, where it's okay to steal. That's just kind of a part of the, of the culture. But there are some societies, if you steal, they cut your hand off right there. There are different societies where it's okay to commit adultery. But in some societies, you, you'll be stoned to death. What are, what are they telling us when they do that? There are some societies where lying is a part of the culture. What are they telling us when they do it? They're telling us that there's, a, there's this remnant of the moral law of God on the conscience of the fallen man. And, and sometimes it, it shines through in different ways and they get it and sometimes they don't get it. And we go as sons and daughters of the second Adam living in anticipation of the eternal paradise grieving over our sin have you ever repented to an unconverted person I did that I've done that a few times in my life and one I remember distinctly where a couple of guys I've told you about it before they lived across the, the street from the facility where I served before I came here and they one of them kind of he thought he was kind of the guardian of the facility he called he said that's my church now the phantom man never stepped inside the doors of that facility to worship but that was it my church and he would call me I don't know he, I just ran some kids off they were out in front of the church building playing I thought they were gonna break the glass so I ran them off and he, he lived in an apartment upstairs so he would you couldn't see him but he could see on the street and he would speak and the kids probably thought God was talking to them or something what are your kids doing and They'd run off, and so he'd call me, let me know, okay? Well, this guy, well, I, the Lord convicted me at one point that I had been friends with, with these two guys. But I hadn't really just, and it invited them to church, but I hadn't really just laid before them their need of Christ. And so I just went over and I said, I need to repent to you guys. They kind of looked at me funny, like one of them was a biker and one of them was a mechanic. And I said, you know, I said, we've known one another how long? I just... And so we've talked about a lot of things. We've talked about lawnmowers, how to fix them. We've talked about your, your bikes. We've talked about this. Then we talked about our facility, what we're doing. We talked about. I said, but you know something I have not ever just laid out to you? The love of Jesus Christ for sinners. And I need to repent and ask you to forgive me. They did not know what to do. <laughs> it, it was like I had walked up and spoken Russian to them. It, it, you see, and I shared the gospel with them, and they listened politely. Well, thank you. No, no, need, no, no, no need to be upset, though. All, none of us is perfect. They, they didn't know how to handle that. But that's, that's who we are. We're, we're those kind of people living in a world that is just is content to be left alone, but when we dare to walk into the arena it is offensive. Now, bless the Lord, there are those times when, when we come in at just the right time and they are wounded, or either they have been wounded, and our word doesn't so much wound as it heals, or perhaps it wounds at the time. 
I got a call when that fellow died. I got a call from his family. I wanted to know if I would do his funeral for him. But he always considered you his pastor, they said. Well, thank the Lord I had not lived across the street from him and never shared the gospel. I mean, I would, I would have had guilt upon guilt heaped upon me, you know. The work of the Spirit. We represent, there is a righteous standard. Well, we don't do it perfectly, but here's the deal. This is the wonderful thing about being a Christian. You know, the next best thing to living perfectly, which none of us do, is being willing to repent when we sin and forgive others when they sin against us. It's a, it's a beautiful thing that the world doesn't know anything about, and it absolutely shows the gospel. Sorrow for sin. Compassion for sinners. And as I said earlier, we remind them of judgment coming. Well, he goes on and, and this and says, uh, verse 12, I have much more to say to you, more than you can bear now. Now, commentators, are, they kind of go off in different directions on this. He's giving them more than he has said and has more to say as recorded in this chapter. And may, it may well be that after he's risen and he spends that that several weeks post-resurrection and he, and he meets with them on the first day of the week and he meets them by the seashore that he's doing more teaching maybe that's part of it or it may be that he's talking about how when the Holy Spirit comes that, that he will teach them through teach them his word through his ministry to them but they can't bear it right now he says and he goes on to say in verse 13 when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He won't speak on his own. That is not his own authority. Whatever he hears, he will speak. Does that remind you of anybody? It reminds you of what Jesus said about his ministry, didn't it? It's the very same thing. I don't speak on my own. What the Father tells me to speak, I speak. What the Father tells me to do, I do. I do nothing on my own uh, accord. I'm simply following the Father's will. Now the Holy Spirit comes. Isn't this wonderful? They've heard Jesus say this. And so he's helping them to connect that the one whom I'm sending who will make things better for you than, than it, it would be if I stay. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. You know, you heard people saying, perhaps you've even thought this before, well, if, if only I could have walked with Jesus, if I could have been there with him, if I could have touched him, if I could have laid on his bosom like, like John did. If, if, folks, they did it, <laughs> and they all abandoned him in Gethsemane. That's the, that's the functional historical reality. But the theological reality is that Jesus said we're better off with him going. That we're not, we're not shorthanded here. We're enhanced that he's gone back to the Father and sent the Spirit. In fact, ask the question, what transformed these eleven? Did the upper room discourse do it? No, because they went from the upper room to Gethsemane and they all ran away. What transformed the eleven was when the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost and the same fellow, Peter, who had impetuously cut off the ear of a servant, who had, who had intensely denied Jesus when a servant girl approaches him. We hadn't gotten to that yet in the narrative on Sunday morning. When a servant girl approaches him and he does exactly what Jesus said he was going to do, he denies him before the rooster crows. The same fellow comes out of the upper room at Pentecost and preaches with a boldness that is, that is astounding. It's breathtaking. What, what, was, what was the transformation? Just as Jesus had said, when I go away and the Spirit comes, it will, you'll be better be better off. He goes on in verse 14 to talk about how uh, he'll bring glory, he'll glorify me, he'll take what is mine and declare it 
to you. So the, the ministry, my teaching ministry, will continue in a different context. He'd already said something like this. If you remember, we looked at John 14, uh, going through that, that wonderful passage, Do not let your heart be troubled. Well, verse 26 of John 14, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. This, this verse here is just is amazing because here you have a Trinitarian assertion. The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. The great uh, creeds of, of Christendom speak of how the, Father, how the Son is the eternal generation of the Father. Then it speaks of the Holy Spirit, who, who from, from both, from the Father and the Son, forever proceeds. It's, it's language that you, you meditate on it and you realize that this, the eternality of the Trinity and the, and the cohesiveness, the, the co-essentiality of the Trinity. About the same work to glorify God in the salvation of his people. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2 it, it tells us Paul is talking to the Corinthian church about something of the work of the Spirit and I want you to see this here just real quickly verse 10 and following says these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit for the Spirit searches everything even the depths of God for who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him so also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God in other words he said you would never on your own they, they're limited, let me be careful here, they're limited in the teaching ministry of Jesus because it's, it's from his mouth to their ears. When the Holy Spirit comes to, to save them in the new birth and indwell them, then they are brought into contact with the mind of God through the word of God. Josh kind of referenced this this morning, singing this, this hymn that we were singing. It was full of, full of wonderful biblical truth and it, it, it struck him in a way while we were singing. What is, what do you, how do you explain that? Well, some people say it's an aha moment. Well, it, it is the illumination of the Spirit taking the truth of God and bringing, bringing the mind of God to us on that matter, on those things. And we, it happens to you all the time, whether you call it that or not. Have you ever read through a, just an example, you ever read through a passage, maybe several times, and then you go back through it, even in your, either in your reading or you're reading someone else's comments on it or you're hearing it taught or preached, and something comes off the page to you and you go, I never saw that before. I hope that happens to you. <laughs> now, how do you explain that? Well, you can say, well, I wasn't. No, I think, I think serious students had that. That happens to me. And I go, man, this is rich. This is rich. And the Holy Spirit will bring these things to our remembrance. Brothers, we, we are weak. We forget. Will you agree that we do forget things? That we, There are things that we've learned that we forget? He tells us the Spirit will bring these things to our remembrance. He, he said in the, in the upper room, rem, do this in remembrance of me. We're, we're frail creatures prone to forgetfulness. Well, let's look at this, what he, what he talks about the Spirit here. Who has known person's thoughts except the spirit of the person so also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God now we have received not the spirit of the world but the spirit who is from God in order that we might understand the things freely given us by God that's rich and we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom so it's not sophistry this is this is taking divine revelation, being illumined and communicating revelation as it's illumined to us. Not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. And then he says this, why does this surprise us? The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. Why? Because the Spirit doesn't indwell them. They're folly to him. He's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things but is himself 
to be judged by no one. It's, people can be judgmental towards you, but guess what? Guess what? In the final day, when the Spirit who comes to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and when judgment comes, guess what? People who are judgmental toward you, guess where they're going to be? Standing next to you in judgment. We're not going to be judged by any man. We come before the beam of the, 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 the great white throne judgment of God. Robed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Verse 16, who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? A reference to Isaiah 40, that wonderful passage. But we have the mind of Christ. Now, what he's telling us there is that we have dwelling in us the Holy Spirit who is teaching us the, the word of God and the will of God and the way of God through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He, is, he, he speaks not of his own authority. He speaks by the authority given him by the Father to talk about the Son and point to the Son and glorify the Son. That doesn't mean we got it perfectly because Paul said to the Philippians, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. In other words, it's a cultivated thing. Some point along the way we've got to understand if, we, if we're content to neglect the means of grace, if we neglect personal prayer, personal Bible study, corporate prayer, corporate study, fellowship, worship, giving, witnessing, if we, if we neglect the means of grace God has ordained whereby we grow, then we will, we have the mind of Christ dwelling in us in the person of the Spirit, but we will not express our thoughts and our ways and our, and our, our words in that mindset. But we have it. And as much as we have the Spirit, we have the mind of Christ. And the Spirit reveals truth. He promises that. Look real, real quickly. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 to 12. Peter's talking, he says, concerning the salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. What is he saying? He's talking about that the prophets who wrote, wrote under the inspiration of the Spirit of Christ as they tried to understand the timetable, God's timetable in, in bringing his deliverer to the people. It was revealed to them, verse 12, that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Angels who inhabit heaven gaze upon the glory, the Shekinah of God. Spend their time crying holy 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 they will never know what you and I know because we are saved by grace through faith the Holy Spirit indwells us something the angels will never know the indwelling of the Spirit they look they long they peer into it is the language here Second Peter chapter 1 verse 21 for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man now there, <laughs> there's a lot of false prophets out there making false prophecy he's talking about the real article the genuine thing no you can say no real prophecy no prophecy of God was ever produced by the will of man but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit escorted guarded and so this this promise that the Holy Spirit will come and then verse 15, Jesus says, All that belongs to the Father is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. That is, that he, the Spirit, will take what is mine and declare it to you. It's a wonderful promise that they have. One, I love what one writer said about this. He said, What belongs to the Father and Son is actually given to me. It's like being told that the Colorado River is mine. The question is, how can I harness and utilize the potential power in the river? If you've ever been to the Grand Canyon, you've watched that, it's pretty awesome to see the Colorado. I've never been down on the floor, but I've, I've watched videos of people who get on rafts in the Colorado River, and it's quite a ride. It's an incredible force of water. How do you harness that river? Well, the answer in that part of the country is the Hoover Dam, which daily produces many megawatts of electricity but the power of the mighty Colorado channeled through the Hoover Dam is only useful when it's released to me in a measured way. Isn't that beautiful? It's a powerful picture there. God's truth were unleashed on us, folks. 
It would kill us. Just like if God had let Moses, granted Moses his request, let me see you, he said, on Sinai. God said, no man has seen me and lived. So I'm going to hide you in the cleft of the rock. I'm going to pass by. My hinder parts pass by. All he saw was the, was the was, we, we call it the backside, the hinder side of God. The, and he came down from the mountain beaming so much that he terrified the people. And that's all he saw. If, if God would have just unveiled himself, to, it would have killed Moses right there. The same thing with you and me. The truth that's available to us is given to us in measure by the Holy Spirit feeding us. Again, test this. You were a younger believer and you dealt with certain besetting sins, right? As, is anyone here, as you've grown in grace, discovered other aspects of sin in your life that you really didn't know about or face when you were younger? Sure we have. We all do. That's called progressive sanctification. Why does that happen? Again, if when we were initially saved at the... If the if the curtain was drawn back on our utter sinfulness, it would kill us. And so the Spirit works in us to overcome and subdue remaining sin. And we go, well, thank the Lord. I, that used to be on top of me. And thank God, I, I think I've got it, I got it pinned. And the Spirit says, good. I want to show you something. <laughs> what? Yeah, we need to deal with this. Oh, it's a mercy in the way he, he, he works with us. Now, what do we, what do we need? I'm, I'm running behind here. I need to try to tie this together. What is he going to show them in all of this? What has he shown them? In fact, I think I'm going to pick that up next week. I'm going to look at the rest of, of 16. Then we're going to come back next week and we're going to look at these, these lessons from here. Look at the rest of this. Here he's, he's really trying to encourage them. He's, he's given them some incredible reality about the, about the coming of the Holy Spirit and the work. He says in verse 16, A little while and you'll see me no longer. And again a little while and you'll see me. It seems to me he's talking there about pretty soon you're not going to see me. I'm going to take him from you. But then he would rise from the grave and they would see him again for a little while. But then they, after that little while they would not see him any longer. Some disciples said, well, what's does he say? That's a little while and you'll not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me because I'm going to the Father. And they were talking about this. What does he mean by a little? We don't know what you're talking about. So he said to them, is this not what you were asking yourselves? What I meant by saying a little while and you'll see me and again, a little while and you'll see me. You'll not see me and then you will see me. Truly I say to you, you will weep and lament but the world will rejoice. My brothers and sisters, you know something of that right now. It breaks your heart to see some of the things, some of the agendas advancing. But seemingly no one on the horizon to impede them, to stop them. You know, it's one of the candidates who's not a politician, I want to be careful, I don't want to be political in this pulpit, one, I think his popularity is that, he, that people really hope that if, if he's put in office that he will stop a lot of this stuff. Brothers and sisters, this is set in motion. There are courts that are, that judges sitting in courts that would have to be replaced. There, there's things happening right now that, uh, that will hammer out for years no matter who's in the White House come January. And so we long for that. We, we want, and it grieves us. And while we're grieving, what are we seeing? Ah, great victory. A great advance for the culture. It hurts. It hurts. You'll be sorrowful, verse 20, but your sorrow will turn to joy. And here's their, here's their promise. He's given to them. Your sorrow, you're going to be sorrowful. He doesn't deny that. Your sorrow will turn to joy. And if you just trace this out, and use this analogy of birth, and I... I can identify. I can observe. I can tell you what my life's told me. And you've seen the cartoons, you've seen the comedies where the woman's about to give birth and her husband's there and she begins to scream at him, you know, just, <laughs> just violently, what have you done to me, sort of thing. Uh, as the trauma of birth approaches. But at the end of it is great joy. 
I don't know that I've ever, I mean, I've visited a lot of hospitals in the aftermath of a lot of births, and I've been in on some births myself. And I've never met a woman yet who said, well, that wasn't worth it at all. No, no. <laughs> when, you, when you talk with them, they, all the pain melts away. That's what he's talking about here. That, that's the analogy he uses here. And think about it. Think about Ride the roller coaster with them. He's, a, he's, he's about to be snatched from them. We read that this morning. He's taken from them. They run for their lives. He's going to be taken through unspeakable agony. Nailed to a cross. Buried. Devastated. They're devastated. Then they get word that he's risen, and they can hardly believe it, and yet they do discover he has risen, just as he said, and they do believe it, and they, they rejoice that he, and guess what? He departs. Ride the roller coaster with them. And so, about ten days after his departure, there's a festival called Pentecost. And I don't want to be misunderstood here. But do you get the sense after Pentecost that the apostles ever sat around saying, I'll tell you what, we sure do miss Jesus. And I'm sure they did. But the Holy Spirit came and took them into a level, and just as he had promised, you see, they saw him speak to thousands in John 6, and thousands walked away. Yet at Pentecost, they spoke to thousands, and thousands followed. He said, you'll see greater things than you've seen me do. Their sorrow did turn to joy. That's my point. Verse 22, you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. And is it, that is the mark if you study history. If, you, if you've read Fox's Book of Martyrs and if you've read the, the update put out by the voice of the martyrs, of, of martyrs of the 20th and 21st century, there is a theme that runs through it all. And it begins in the book of Acts. They counted it all joy that they were considered worthy of suffering for the name. It's remarkable. No one, he says, can take your joy from you. Parenthetically, let me say, we can surrender it. We can give it up. We can, we can let other things be fixed on what, we, what pleases us, what gives us happiness. We talk about the difference in that. And we will surrender that joy. We will, we will put it on ice. But no one, can, no one can take your joy from you. They can't do it. No matter how terrible the circumstances, in that day, verse 23, you will ask nothing of me. Truly I say to you, whatever you ask of my Father in my name, he will give you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you'll receive that your joy may be full. I've said these things to you in figures of speech. He talks about the day coming uh, when he will, uh, will not speak that way. To them, he will speak plainly to them. And he does some of that, I think, post-resurrection. But I think also when the Spirit comes, the Spirit makes His teaching plain to them. In that day, verse 26, you'll ask in my name. I do not say that I will ask the Father on your behalf. Why? For the Father Himself loves you. Notice the change that's coming. You don't have to talk to me about it to get the Father to do it. You can talk to the Father about it in my name. He will do it. That's, the, that's one of the blessed benefits of the Holy Spirit. The Father himself loves you because you've loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into this world. Now I'm leaving the world and going to the Father. His disciples said, ah, what's happening? It's beginning to make sense to them. Now you're speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things. And do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus says to them, this is painful, brothers, sisters. Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I'm not alone. 
for the Father is with me. And in the final verse of this passage, I have said these things to you so that in me you may have peace. That sounds for me, doesn't it? John chapter 14. He's still, he's still thinking about their well-being. He's preparing them for his departure. In the world you will have tribulation. That word there, tribulation, is an interesting word. When you look at it, it's a word picture. And I can give it to you a good, a good accurate. In this world you will be squeezed. Take heart. I've overcome the world. And so he's given them these teachings before he goes to pray in order that they might be prepared for his departure and believe that on the other side of it, though it would get dark and desperate, that on the other side of it, joy would come. And most of these men hearing this ultimately were martyred for the faith. John was exiled. And yet, they went through this frailly. They didn't, they, you'd like to think, well, well they were ready for it. Well, he, he, they were prepared from his teaching but they had to experience it. They went through this painfully. They came out on the other side of it prepared. The Holy Spirit took these things and made them real to, him, to them. And they were bold witnesses for Christ that you could not, you could not get them to back down. You could not get them to deny. He had done His work. That's why when He prays in John 17, I wanted you to see this here. I have finished the work of you have given me to do. Really? You haven't died on the cross yet. Well, he's, a, he's as good as dead on the cross. But that's not the instance of what he's saying. here. He could have said, those you've given me are ready. They had become disciples ready to make disciple makers. And what did it look like? That band of 11, soon to be 12, if you call, count the 120 in the upper room, looked up and saw 5,000, thousands more. They were spread by persecution all over the known world, and those thousands turned into tens of thousands, into hundreds of thousands, into millions, multiplied millions. that would not have happened had Jesus stayed. In his confinements, as Philippians 2 talks about in the Incarnation, he could be here, but not there. In the coming of the Holy Spirit, he indwells every believer. So that tonight, as a follower of Jesus Christ, you have as much of the Holy Spirit living in you as anyone that you think of and say, well, that person, that, that's, a, that's an incredibly spiritually minded man. <clears throat> and he doesn't have more of the Holy Spirit than you do. And you have the Holy Spirit living in you. And he's living in those in Iran, in Iraq. Afghanistan, North Korea, Syria, Nigeria, Texas, Arkansas, New York, California, Canada, Mexico, Haiti. I mean, this same Holy Spirit indwells every believer. He is the Spirit of Christ. He does glorify Christ. That's why Jesus said it's necessary that I go away. The gospel, the advance of the gospel was dependent not only on his death on the cross, not only on his resurrection from the grave, but also his ascension on high, his departure and his sending of the Holy Spirit to come and advance the gospel. 
you're enabled to be disciple makers. Not only because of what Jesus taught, but because he's given you the Holy Spirit to indwell you and to lead you into all the truth. The devil may say that you're a $5 bar of iron. But you're a priceless, a priceless masterpiece of Jesus Christ. And the only thing that can stop you in the advance of the gospel is you. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? It's the only thing that stops you. It's the only thing that stops me. Is me. So my prayer is that we will take to heart Jesus' teaching. We will, we will embrace His wisdom and experience the fullness of the Spirit and the power of the Spirit. And be champions for Christ that the devil may have been lying to you for years saying you could not be that because of this or that or the other. If the Spirit of Christ dwells in you, He leads you into the truth of Jesus. One of the chief truths being go and make disciples of all the nations. Let's talk for a few minutes before we dismiss tonight. What, 